Now, another Latin American official whose death raises questions as to whether he also was killed to keep the Contra supply effort quiet was a fellow named Dr. Hugh, Hugo Spadafora, S-P-A-D-A-F-O-R-A. And uh, about Dr. Hugo Spadafora, Millman writes as follows in that same article. Uh, by the way, this section is subheaded, Drugs, Costa Rica, and the Contras. At almost the same time that Zuniga disappeared, the body of another key player in the Contra War was found stuffed in a U.S. mailbag in Costa Rica, just over the border from Panama. The head had been removed and the torso was covered with bruises. A preliminary autopsy revealed that the victim had been alive when he, had been alive when he was decapitated. On the skin was carved the legend F-8, a cryptic message Costa Rican officials believed linked the murder to the Panamanian, Panamanian military. The dead man was a Panamanian, Dr. Hugo Spadafora. Spadafora was a romantic figure of some renown in Latin America, the latest in a long line of bourgeois codillos, men of revolutionary action, whose legacy stretches from Simon Bolivar to Fidel Castro and Eden Pastora. Spadafora, like Che Guevara, was trained as a medical doctor and had even served briefly as the country's vice minister of health. Like Che, the Panamanian was attracted to revolutions at home and abroad, volunteering to fight with the Marxist rebels in Guinea-Bissau in the mid-1960s, then with Pastora against Somoza in 1979. In 1982, he joined Pastora's Contra forces, staying with them until 1984 when he broke off to form his own democratic Contra army based in Costa Rica. Given Spadafora's quite public opposition to Panamanian leader General Manuel Antonio Noriega, there seems little doubt that his, mur that his murder was ordered or at least welcomed in Panama. But the real reason for the killing may rest with Spadafora's knowledge of widespread drugs for arms trafficking within the Contra movement in Costa Rica. The earliest indications of a Contra drug operation in Costa Rica emerged in the summer of 1985 when an unnamed top drug enforcement administration official from the U.S. Embassy in San Jose told the English-language daily Tico Times that Contras were now part of the drugs for arms trade that was becoming increasingly common throughout Latin America. Spadafora believed that his political enemy, Panama's General Noriega, was involved in the Contra drug trade. A later Associated Press story by reporters Brian Barger and Robert Perry mentioned a U.S. intelligence study that lengthy forces of Aden Pastora, a Spadafora ally turned rival to drug trafficking, alleging that some 250,000 in drug crop profits had been used to buy ammunition and a new helicopter. During the week before his abduction, Spadafora visited the U.S. Embassy in San Jose, where, according to the local daily La Nación, he met three times with the United States' top drug investigator in Costa Rica, DEA Special Agent Robert Nieves, or Nieves, N-I-E-V-E-S. Nieves later dismissed their conversations as nothing important, unquote, but sources familiar with the pair's conversations say Spadafora linked a noted Contra drug smuggler from Costa Rica and said the smuggler had fled to Panama and was being protected by General Noriega's army. The cavalier attitude with which, with which Spadafora's claims were apparently met fits a disturbing pattern of seeming indifference on the part of U.S. officials toward knowledgeable informants who raise concerns about Contra activities. Had he lived, Spadafora could well have testified about cocaine smuggling in other Contra camps and raise new questions about how seriously the DEA's information was being taken in Washington. So yet, perhaps another casualty in the ongoing uh, uh, hit parade, which appears to have uh, centered around the Iran-Contra scandal. Indeed, and uh, with that, we are going to again take a break and give you a chance to do the same, and those of you taping at home, a chance to turn your tape recorders off, I suppose, and conserve some tape. And uh, we will be back to talk about more of the depressing same <laughs> in just a few minutes when Dave Emery and myself, Nip Tuck, return with more of Radio Free America. What we're talking about tonight is we're talking about bodies and break-ins, dead guys and illegal incursions, or however you want to phrase it. And that is indeed, uh, this is, not only is it part five of six of the Iran-Contra hearings, but this is part one of two of the cover-up of the Iran-Contra scandal. So uh, tonight's part of the cover-up are the dead people who will not testify and the break-ins that we'll get to a little later in the broadcast that will prevent people from having the information necessary to uh, get at the truth. And uh, the truth has proved to be very difficult to get at in this case. 
as uh, an article that we just finished reading was entitled, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Now, we're going to begin looking at a number of people who dropped dead during the course of the Iran-Contra investigation, which link a number of European connections to the investigation. We're going to begin by taking a look at a fellow who worked with Oliver North on the Achille Loro hijacking. Now, this is significant for our purposes because one of the key elements in the Iran-Contra supply effort, the Contra supply effort, was a Syrian-born terrorist armor, armorer, a supplier of arms to terrorists, called Manzer el Kassar. He was a fellow who was described as being close to not only Abu Abbas, but Abu Nidal, and close to, uh, thereby, by being close to Abu Abbas, the fellow who uh, masterminded the Achille Loro hijacking. That particular hijacking, as well, p quite possibly, as Manzer el Kassar himself, appears to have had a number of connections with uh, residual Nazi elements both inside our own intelligence system and street-level neo-Nazis in Europe. We talked about that at considerable length in, in Radio Free America 32. We're not going to go into it now. But suffice it to say that uh, someone who worked with Oliver North on uh, the Achille Loro hijacking and apparently must have been involved in the entire Iranian arms situation himself was a fellow named Arthur Moreau. We're going to read you about Arthur Moreau now, then we're going to tell you what happened to him. All right, the first article of this part of the broadcast is from the New York Times for Saturday, January 3rd of 1987. The headline, North's Record, A Wide Role in a Host of Sensitive Projects. The article is written by Keith Schneider as a, as a special to the New York Times. It's Dateline, Washington. Rarely has one man's silence stirred such curiosity or held such consequence of that as that of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver L. North. Since he was dismissed from the National Security Council staff by President Reagan on November 25th for his purported role in diverting profits from the Iranian arms sales to Nicaraguan rebels, Colonel North has said virtually nothing about his role in the affair. In recent weeks, however, through interviews with more than 40 current and former top-ranking officials in the White House, the State Department, and the Pentagon, a clearer picture of Colonel North's five-year career on the staff of the National Security Council has emerged. Skipping along in the article itself to another page. Probably the most important step in Colonel North's career on the National S Security Council staff, according to former staff members, occurred in the spring of 1983 when he was appointed to a secret Central America policy group that met regularly at the State Department. The group called the Restricted Interagency Group was formed in 1981 by Thomas O. Enders, then Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. Along with Mr. Enders, the group's members included Dwayne Claridge, a Central Intelligence Agency official and expert on covert operations, Vice Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, Jr., and Moreau's last name is spelled M-O-R-E-A-U, a representative from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Nestor Sanchez, a representative from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Skipping down, just oh, well, let me just recap that real quickly. The restricted interagency group that was founded uh, by Thomas O. Enders included not only North, but Dwayne Claridge, somebody we've talked about in the past, Vice Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, and Nestor Sanchez. Skipping down in the article. By late 1985, it would have been second nature for Mr. McFarland to seek Colonel North's assistance. In mid-June that year, Colonel North had been dispatched to the Middle East by Mr. McFarland, of course, his National Security uh, Council, uh, National Security Advisor Robert McFarland, by Mr. McFarland to monitor the hijacking of a TWA jet in which 39 Americans had been taken hostage. A White House official said Colonel North was working closely with the Delta, with the Delta Force, a counterterrorist military unit. Then in October, Colonel North offered a suggestion to Vice Admiral John M. Poindexter, then the Deputy National Security Advisor, for capturing the hijackers of the Italian cruise ship Achille Laro. Colonel North said the United States could intercept the four men over the Mediterranean while they were being flown from Egypt to Tunis and divert the plane to Italy. Admiral Poindexter and Admiral Moreau of the Joint Chiefs of Staff helped the military plan and perform the mission, according to State Department officials. Colonel North coordinated the intelligence, diplomatic, and military activity from the Crisis Management Center. So, uh, Dwayne Claridge is still alive, although he's a fascinating figure in this whole thing. We won't talk about him. What we are going to talk about now is Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, a man um, in the middle of the restricted interagency group, a man whose involvement in the, along with Admiral Poindexter, who most of you know, 
uh, who man whose involvement in the Achille Lauro case with uh, with Colonel North uh, is significant, and uh, Admiral Moreau is another man who is not around to talk about some of the things he might know. And again, the Achille Lauro hijacking is the key here, as well as the uh, connection of Banzer El Kassar. That's uh, the reason we cited that to that last article. Now, Admiral Arthur Moreau is no longer on the scene. Reading now from the San Francisco Examiner of Tuesday, December 9th of 1986. This is an AP story, Dateline, Naples, Italy. It's an obituary for Admiral Arthur Moreau, Jr. U.S. Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, Jr., the commander of NATO forces in southern Europe, died Monday of a heart attack, military officials said. He was 55. Admiral Moreau, who also was commander of U.S. naval forces in Europe, died in a military hospital in this port city. His death was announced by a U.S. Navy spokesman in London, Captain Gordon Peterson, and confirmed in Naples by the Allied forces in southern Europe. Admiral Moreau, who was appointed to the posts in September of 1985 and took command two months later, headed the largest of the four military regions under Allied command, Europe. His area of responsibility covered Italy, Greece, Turkey, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. Again, his area of responsibility covered Italy, Greece, Turkey, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean. His command included the U.S. 6th Fleet, Command Fleet Air Mediterranean, and U.S. Naval Activities United Kingdom. From May of 1983 to October of 1985, he served as assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His previous posts included Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operation, and Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Naval Station at Subic Bay, Philippines. The point being here that Arthur Moreau was uh, almost certainly seems to have to have been involved in uh, the Iranian arms transactions uh, in as much as his responsibility included the Mediterranean. Uh, he also was involved in the Aquila Loro hijacking and Oliver North's handling of that. We dealt with Aquila Loro and uh, the many connections of that uh, particular incident to the Iran-Contra scandal in Radio Free America number 32. Now bear in mind what we looked at at the top of this broadcast where Oliver North said that uh, if the Iranians again were guilty of duplicity, perhaps another one of their assets in the hands of one of their people in the hands of our assets might have another heart attack. Obviously, heart attacks appear to have been something that this group could bring about. One wonders whether Arthur, Arthur Moreau's heart attack was natural or not. Yes, heart attacks do appear to have been rather common currency in the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, we're going to read about somebody who met a slightly less uh, uh, peaceful death than a heart attack. Um, from the San Francisco Examiner for Sunday, July 26, 1987, it's a small article in The World section, and it's headlined, Lauro Figures Suicide. A Palestinian acquitted of minor charges in the 1985 hijacking of the Italian cruise liner Achille Laro jumped to his death from his Rome apartment Saturday while police were trying to arrest him on a Syrian warrant for fraud. Police said his death was a suicide. The dead man was Saeed Mufak Gandura, G-A-N-D-U-R-A, aged 38, who said he was a colonel in the intelligence service of the Palestine Liberation Organization. The PLO denied that Gandura was a PLO official. Um, again, some, one of the interesting things, those of you who heard some of our other broadcasts might pick up the perhaps the, the possible significance of this, uh, this, uh, his PLO affiliation or non-affiliation. One of the things that we talked about is that uh, the, the people who were involved in the Achille Lauro and certain other cases um, were uh, many of them uh, essentially rogue PLO. They were non-PLO people. And as a matter of fact, people who felt that uh, that Yasser Arafat was too uh, middle of the road and too likely to sol to seek political solutions. Many of the same people who have been exploited by, as we said, right-wing uh, European and American sources because of their terror value. So the fact that this man, uh, Gandura, who claimed he was a PLO official, the PLO denied that he was an official. Uh, again, the idea that he should jump out of a window uh, because the police were trying to arrest him on a, on a warrant for fraud is rather interesting. Uh, the police calling it a suicide is interesting, and the fact that he was already acquitted of charges in the Alaro case suggests that there's something more here than meets the eye, as, as there is with the entire Achille Laro case, especially when it comes to uh, uh, Colonel North and his involvement. Now, there is a very important Italian connection to the Iran-Contragate scandal. 
During the latter part of Radio Free America number 32, our last program on the subject, we dealt with the so-called Italian Iran Gate. We looked at considerable length at how the Italian Iran Gate intersects with the American Iran Gate. We're going to review that briefly, and then we're going to see how the Italian Iran Gate appears to intersect with the Swedish Iran Gate. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, possible connections between that and a couple of assassinations, or an assassination and an apparent assassination in Sweden. But first, Italy. Reading now from the Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle of Wednesday, September 9th of 1987. This is a Chronicle Wire Services story, Dateline Rome, headline, Italy has Iran arms scandal. Investigating magistrates say they have broken up an illegal international arms ring that delivered Italian mines to Iran and involved Middle East terrorists, Syrian agents, Sicilian mafiosi, and European middlemen. At least 34 people, including Italian industrialist Ferdinando Borletti, B-O-R-L-E-T-T-I, have been arrested in the past few days in what Italy's press is calling Italy's Iran Gate scandal. No government officials were implicated. In the latest arrest, Aldo Anghesa, A-N-G-H-E-S-S-A, a mysterious arms trader who left a briefcase full of incriminating documents in a hotel room, turned himself into police yesterday. Eleven people are still being sought. Rome's La Repubblica newspaper said on Monday that the dealings also involved a plot to assassinate President Reagan in Venice last June by shooting down his helicopter. There was no official confirmation of that, but, but authorities say the case will have wide repercussions throughout Europe. Our work is only beginning, Prosecutor Augusto Lama said. We are investigating along several directions. We will turn half of Europe upside down. Lama and other investigating magistrates said the operation involved delivery of mines from Italy to Iran by way of Syria and shipping drugs and weapons to Italy for use by the Mafia and Middle East terrorists. Italy bans military sales to Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Libya. When the Italian Navy arrives in the Persian Gulf, the mines it will try to sweep out of the way of Italian ships, most likely, were manufactured in Italy and illegally supplied to Iran. Prime Minister Giovanni Goria's government is bracing for a parliamentary debate this week on its decision to send a minesweeping force to the Persian Gulf. The naval operation is expected to begin in about a month. Details began emerging last week after the Lebanese cargo ship Bustani I, or Bustani I, was seized off Bari in southern Italy. Police said it was carrying U.S.-made anti-aircraft missiles, Soviet-made grenade launchers, bazookas, and 4.4 pounds of heroin and 33 pounds of hashish. All 17 people aboard, including the Lebanese captain, were arrested. The magistrate said the arms apparently were destined for Middle East terrorist groups operating in Italy and, in Italy and elsewhere in Europe. Lama said the terrorists are believed linked to Palestinian extremist Abu Nidal, accused of masterminding the attacks on the Roman Vienna airports in December of 1985. Lama said two reputed mafia figures from Trapani, Sicily, Felici Corrao and Guido Coduri, were among those arrested last week. He said the mafia was involved in selling drugs, some of whose profits were used to buy more arms, as well as to swell the coffers of both the mob and the terrorists. Industrialist Borletti, 65, and his 33-year-old son Giovanni were both charged with violations of arms laws. Borletti is the chairman of Valsella Meccanotecnica, an arms manufacturer outside Brescia near Milan, and is also a board member of Fiat and of the business daily Il Sole 24 Ore. His son is director general of the arms company. Uh, the key here for our purposes is the Borletti firm, Valsella Mechanotechnica. We're going to get into a couple of interesting connections to that firm right now. One of the articles here, uh, again provided by one of our listeners who also translates for us, is from La Repubblica for September 15, 1987. It talks about these same Borlettis and their company, Valsella Mechanotechnica and goes like this. In a surprise move by the judge, Ferdinando and Giovanni Borletti are out on bail. Following a brief second interrogation, Assistant Prosecutor Lama signed the release order for the President and General Manager of Valsella Meccanotecnica. Count Ferdinando Borletti maintains that he and his son are, quote, the victims of a plot hatched by our competitors, enemies of the state whom we supplied legitimately, and who now seek to discredit us. We don't make mines, unquote. Antonio Toto Minore, the Trapanese mafia boss heavily involved in this case, was recently, recently, was recently assassinated. His family said they received his body in little pieces. The dossier on the Fidelio, a pirate ship captured 13 months ago along the Sicilian coast, was forwarded to Lama. 
So uh, for our purposes, of course, again, now we have these, the, the Borletti's out on jail, on bail, but we also have a connection here between the Valsella Meccano Technica case, what's beginning to be called the Iran-Contra scandal of Italy, and Antonio Toto Minore, the Trapanese Mafia, meaning from the city of Trapani, the Trapanese Mafia chieftain who was assassinated. Um, and uh, the Mafia, and uh, in this case, uh, the Mafia is only one of the many groups that seems to be involved along with the, uh, the Vasella Mocano Technica people in this uh, probably much larger ranging arms scam. Now the key in this particular connection is the fact that Italy's Iran Contragate, as we looked at in the latter part of RFA 32, is co directly connected and appears to be part of, or an offshoot of, America's Iran Contragate scandal. We looked at a number of articles from the Italian press, primarily La, La Repubblica, again researched and translated by our very diligent listener, and those articles revealed that basically the Iranian arms traffickers uh, were indeed acting on behalf of U.S. interests. The key names, Adnan Khashoggi, one of the central people in the Iran-Contra scandal, an associate of his named Adnan Roussan, R-O-U-S-A-N, a person who had been contacting and apparently using Roussan, an American White House official described as Peter Ale, or Ali, A-L-E-Y, and the aforementioned Abu Nidal, one of the contemporary terrorist masterminds, and in many people's opinion, an agent provocateur, and that is the connection, that is, those are the links between the Italian Iran Gate and the American. We're now going to look at a link between the Italian Iran Gate and what, for lack of a better term, we're going to term the Swedish Iran Gate. Research credit for this also goes to a listener. This is from Business Week, specifically Business Week's issue of September 21st of 1987. And in an article by Jonathan Kapstein in Brussels, it's headlined, As Stockholm Lays Siege to Nobel, subheaded, It Wants to Drive Bofors Out of the Arms Business. Now, this deals with the Bofors Arms Manufacturer, a subsidiary of the Nobel firm, and its shipping of mines to Italy and, and through Italy to Iran skipping down into the article and reading part of it. Recent arrests in Italy of executives at a fiat-controlled company over mine sales to Iran turned up a link with Nobel. The Swedish company sold military explosives to Valsello Mechanotechnica of Brescia, where the arrests took place. And when Sweden's ruling Social Democratic Party begins its annual Congress on September 21st, some 30 restrictive resolutions relating to Bofors and arms exports will be on the agenda. The pressure on Penser may just be starting to build. That's one of the people who has been investigating the... the uh, actually, no, that's Nobel's majority owner, uh, a fellow named Eric Penser, P-E-N-S-E-R. So, as we've seen, the Italian Iran Gate, in turn connected to the American Iran Gate, is connected with the Bofors scandal, which we're going to term for the time being the Swedish Iran Gate. And that, in turn, brings us to more bloodshed. That's right. Before we talk too much about the Swedish Iran Gate, we have to talk about the most noted body um, in Swedish politics of recent years, uh, probably ever in Swedish politics in terms of assassinations, and that's Olaf Palma, the former prime minister of uh, Sweden, uh, who was uh, assassinated uh, in February of 1986. And we're going to read an article from In These Times. It gives you a little background on who some of Palma's uh, enemies, uh, well-known enemies within the country of Sweden were. Um, the article is written by Diana Johnson of their Stockholm Bureau uh, for the issue of volume, volume 11, number 16, the issue of March 18th to 24th, 1987. After nearly half a century of social democratic government, Sweden's security police remain firmly in the grip of right-wingers, whose notorious hostility to the late Prime Minister Olaf Palma makes them prime, prime suspects in his unsolved murder. This fact stands out as possibly the most significant amid the debris of the botched year-long investigation of the February 28, 1986 assassination of Palma, who, among Western, Western European leaders, was the most actively committed to world peace. The Swedish security police, known as SAPO, are responsible for investigating foreign subversion and keeping tabs on domestic security risks. By all accounts, people in SAPO, quote, hated Palma's guts. Sapo was supposed to protect the Prime Minister, but according to knowledgeable sources in Stockholm, Sapo had a file on Palma that was by no means for his protection. Many Sapo officers regarded the Prime Minister as a security risk who was selling out Sweden to the Soviet bloc. In his neat apartment in Stockholm, retired Sapo officer Melker Bentler told in these times that right-wing indoctrination in Swedish security police goes back to pro-German feelings in the 1930s. 
At the end of World War II, the pro-German attitude changed to pro-Americanism. The constant factor was viewing communism as the enemy. Sapo depends on the CIA for information about Latin America and considers all political refugees potential, quote, terrorists, according to Bentler, who retired in 1980 at age 65 after 27 years with Sapo. Quote, what the CIA says is the word of God. They depend on it 200 percent, he said. The security police also depend heavily on West German BND and the Israeli Mossad. During the colonel's dictatorship in Greece, Sapo passed along information on Greek political exiles to the, Greeks, to the Greek junta's police via the secret services of NATO allies, Bentler recalled. And although the Swedish Social Democratic Government, that's Olaf Palma's government, although the Swedish Social Democratic Government helped the Mozambique liberation movement Frey Limo that led the country to independence from Portuguese colonialism, Sapo regarded Frey Limo as terrorists, he added. Bentler also said that it was hard to believe that 45% of Swedes are social democrats since he had never met any in Sapo. He became isolated as a maverick in the, in the service after his 1978 complaints about illegal wiretapping became public. Several years ago, on the occasion of another assassination, Bentler recalled hearing colleagues say they wished someone would do the same to that devil Palma. When Palma was assassinated, was assassinated, Bentler said, his first thought was that it must be some extreme conservative group with help from Sapo. Hatred of Palma was shared by several military officers, especially naval officers. Palma was skeptical of the very existence of the, quote, Russian submarine threat dear to Swedish naval officers in their battle to wrest appropriations from Parliament. Suspicion of Palma within Sapo and the armed forces was fed in the Reagan years, from such international networks as the World Anti-Communist League and the Reverend Sun Myung Moon's Causa, with their military and intelligence agency connections and support from the White House. Unofficial Reagan administration spokesmen such as strategist Edward Lutwak publicly suggested that Palma was, quote, manipulated by the Russians. In a November 1984 interview with the Danish business magazine Management, Lutwak predicted Sweden would let Soviet forces cross Swedish territory to invade Denmark and said if he were a Dane, he would consider Olaf Palma more dangerous than the Russians, unquote. Well, quite possibly somebody agreed with him, perhaps somebody in the Swedish security forces, perhaps somebody from the World Anti-Communist League. Um, perhaps there were other reasons behind Olaf Palma's d death, but uh, regardless of what the fact may be, uh, one of the great... Uh, uh, anti-war activist in European politics was shot down in the streets of Stockholm on his way back from a movie and is no longer around and the Swedish police have basically done nothing to solve his case. Now obviously the Reagan administration which was uh, very hostile to Olaf Palme is the the godfather you know spawned the Iran Contra situation. Uh, in addition in our in the in Radio Free America number 15 we speculated at considerable length about Wackel involvement in the assassination of Olaf Palme. The World Anti Anti-Communist League, of course, a central player in the Contra supply effort. And at the end of RFA 15, we took a look at initial reports that Ustashi elements, Croatian fascist elements, had been involved in the assassination of Olaf Palme. We then looked at the operations of residual Ustashi elements, Ustashi elements in the World Anti-Communist League. So the Wackel connection appears open at this point, and given the Iran-Contra situation, is one that bears investigation. It may very well be that Olaf Palme died because of his opposition to the Bofors and slash Nobel supplying of Iran with weapons. This is uh, described in a long article that written, written by syndicated columnist Richard Reeves. Uh, this was originally printed in the New York Times Sunday Magazine section. However, this particular article is from the Monterey Herald's issue of March 1st, 1987. Research credit on this, by the way, goes to May Russell, a top researcher in this field. And this particular article is headlined, Sweden's Arms Deal with Iran. No, actually, it's headlined, Was Swedish Leader of Victim Subheaded Sweden's Arms Deal with Iran? Again, by Richard Reeves. Skipping down on the article, we're not going to read the whole thing, it's very long. The truth may be far worse than the Swedish people now know or ever will know if some high officials succeed in an apparent attempt to block certain lines of investigation. A month-long inquiry by this reporter involving more than a hundred interviews in Sweden and four other countries 
produced strong evidence that police and prosecutors may have been restrained and perhaps misled by their own government, particularly the foreign ministry. While the police were chasing right-wing pamphleteers and police and, and a violent little gang of Kurdish communists, some Swedish authorities, including cabinet members, were coming to a more dangerous conclusion. That Palme died because of his clumsy involvement as a mediator in the Iran-Iraq war at the same time that Swedish arms makers were illegally shipping weapons to one side, Iran. The complicated and secret weapons dealings in many ways paralleled the controversial American transactions with Iran and have raised the same kinds of questions about who in government knew what and when. Regardless of who knew in Sweden, secret service agencies of other countries have offered the Swedish government information indicating that Palme's murder might be traced to his decision to block arms deliveries to Iran after illegal sales of surface-to-air missiles, howitzers and gunpowder became public in late 1985. Beyond that, some members of the cabinet have concluded that the subsequent death of a second Swedish official, regarded as an accident by the police, was probably a murder linked to the Palme investigation and the same arms transactions. That official was the foreign ministry officer responsible for approving all material exports, a former admiral named Carl Frederik Algernon, A-L-G-E-R-N-O-N, who fell or was pushed in front of a subway train in Stockholm Central Station on January 15th six days before he was to testify before a special prosecutor investigating the illegal arms shipments. Many Swedes don't want to know the truth about what happened. For them, it's over. There seems to be no thirst or need of revenge. Third, no thirst for or need of revenge. That may be the ultimate Swedish decency. Prime Minister Ingvar Karlsson, an unobtrusive party and government functionary his whole life, has united most of the country, or at least calmed it. According to one poll, the Palme's Social Democrats have gone up ten points in popularity since his death. Neither are the friends of Palme driven by a desire for revenge or vindication. His story is over, said Dieter Strand, a popular newspaper columnist and author of a biography of Palme. I heard similar lines elsewhere. I could never be quoted on this, but I hope they never find the murderer, said a friend in the current government. It would trivialize Olaf's life, vulgarize it. He would have to share history with a crazed assassin, unquote. Then there is the powerful group, few and highly placed, including some in the foreign ministry and members of the current cabinet, who do not believe the assassin was crazy at all. Such people obviously would not speak for the record, but half a dozen in high, exp high positions expressed the belief and the fear that the truth might destroy confidence in both the party and the Social Democratic Party. They believed Palme and Algernon, too, were murdered because of Sweden's official and unofficial, well-meaning and profit-seeking meddling in the Persian Gulf War. Skipping down... The trail of events that was effectively closed to investigators began in November of 1980. Palme, who had been defeated in the 1976 election, was bored and irritable as opposition leader. He missed the world spotlight that had played on him as a vehement opponent of the Vietnam War. He jumped when UN Secretary General Kurt Waldheim asked him to try to mediate the bloody war between Iran and Iraq, then a year old. Until 1983, the year after he, re he won re-election as Prime Minister, Palme continued to make trips to Iran and Iraq, shuttling between Tehran and Baghdad with an entourage from the Swedish Foreign Ministry. Many of the diplomats stayed on in the warring capitals. Their presence laid, led to the later suspicion that the governments must have known of weapons shipments to Iran by Sweden's great arms manufacturer, the Bofors Group of Nobel Industries. Swedish law prohibits sales by Bofors and other private arms companies in war zones, which by Swedish definition includes much of the world, certainly the Persian Gulf and the entire Middle East. But Sweden is also a country that maintains its high standard of living, per capita income is 25% higher than in the United States, through foreign trade. Arms sales are part of that prosperity. Weapons may account for 5% or more of Sweden's annual exports of about $45 billion, which is more than a third of its gross national product. The government has been known to look the other way on weapon sales, liberally granting export permits that certified that material was not headed for war zones. Singapore was the favored shipping point for Bofors equipment, especially its highly regarded RBS-70 surface-to-air anti-aircraft missile launcher. From that port, the RBS-70s were sent on to, among other places, Iran, being transshipped a second time from Dubai or Bahrain. Then someone inside Bofors blew the whistle, leaking information on the deals to peace groups on the left wing of Palme Social Democrats. Details began to leak out about a series of shipments between October of 1984 and May of 1985, apparently all headed toward Iran. 
Train loads of Bofors gunpowder had been seized by customs, officer and was customs officers in West Germany and Italy. Other train loads and perhaps naval cannons had gotten through by way of Austria, Yugoslavia, and Singapore. 200 RBS 70s had been delivered to Iran, part of an order for 400 placed by the Iranian government. An additional 800 to 1200 RBS 70s could not quite be accounted for, although they were known to have passed through Dubai and Bahrain. Directors of Bofors have insisted that the company has done nothing that was illegal or that was not known to the government. Palme, facing re-election in 1985, appointed a special prosecutor to investigate the sales. And he stopped the shipments, at least for a time. Specifically, he blocked the 200 additional RBS 70s that Iran had ordered. Also, according to sources in the French Foreign Ministry, the Swedish Prime Minister ordered a ship loaded with 155 millimeter howitzers stopped as it was leaving the port of Malmo, bound for Dubai, and then, it is believed, Iran. And skipping down still further, the arms investigation continued after Palme's assassination and eventually centered on the Inspector of War Material, Admiral Algernon. His testimony was scheduled for January 21st. He was working on it January 15th. His death that day was big news. Police initially said there, that there were witnesses who had seen a man with his hands on Algernon's chest, but only one newspaper bothered to speculate on its possible connection to Palme's, with Palme's killing. The next day, the police announced that witnesses, there were at least two, who said that Algernon was pushed in front of the train, were mistaken, unquote. The case was closed. Algernon's name disappeared from the press. Well, in light of the open U.S. hostility to uh, Olaf Palme, in light of the fact that uh, the SAPO, the Swedish security police, were closely affiliated with CIA and with the BND, the Galen Organization, which also has strong links to this whole situation. Recall the uh, International Imaging Systems link with TCI. Recall the, uh, the Merex connection that we discussed in Radio Free America number 32. The Galen geniture of the uh, secret services of, Italy, of uh, Egypt and Libya that we talked about in Gaddafi, the Triple Wilson team, etc. It, it shouldn't surprise us too much to see a BND connection with SAPO, but bearing in mind the hostility of SAPO, the hostility of the World Anti-Communist League to Olaf Palme, the fact that Bofors was obviously hooked up with the Italian Iran Gate, Valsella Meccano Technica, that we know was hooked up with our Iran Gate, given the initial reports of Ustashi involvement in the assassination of Olaf Palme, uh, many questions do have to be asked still about whether or not uh, his death was due to his attempts to interfere with Bofors and whether perhaps the United States may have been centrally involved in his death. Uh, the, the initial reports being squelched by police as they appear to have been uh, very reminiscent of the assassinations in, that have taken place in this country, the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, and others. That's right, yes. Uh, it's frighteningly reminiscent, yes. The, all the witnesses who uh, can't be found afterward or change their minds after being talked to by the police. The uh, the Iran the Italian Iran's ca Iran arms case and the Swedish Iran arms case um, are apparently only the tip of the iceberg as far as European arms dealings go. Um, there's another case we're going to talk about here that is a fairly new one actually, and more will be probably found out about it, but seems to tie back into some other things. And this is from the Wall Street Journal. We just read this uh, a little while ago on the Sunday show. Uh, the Wall Street Journal for Tuesday, September 22nd, 1987. The headline, Europeans slow the flow of arms to Iran. Crackdown is raising embarrassing questions. And research credit on this also goes to May Brussel. The police raid this month. Oh, the article, by the way, was reported by Mark M. Nelson, Laura Colby, and Marcus W. Brauke. Uh, the police raid this month on the Linz, Austria offices of Noricum AG the arms-making subsidiary of Vost Alpine AG, set off a national scandal in Austria. Front pages bannered news that the raid yielded records detailing the concerned sales of at least 140 artillery pieces to Iran. Noricum's former chief was arrested and there were dark reminders that an Austrian ambassador to Greece and the former chairman of Vost both died suddenly while giving evidence on the case to authorities. They want to re repeat that last sentence, Nip. That's the, maybe the key in this And whole it's article. also a long sentence. Um, front page has bannered news that the raid yielded records detailing the concerned sale of at least 140 artillery pieces to Iran. Noricum's former chief was arrested and there were dark reminders that an Austrian ambassador to Greece and the former chairman of Vost both died suddenly while giving evidence on the case to authorities. 
The sales could have amounted to as many as 600 sophisticated big guns with a total value of 7.2 billion Austrian shillings or 564 point seven million dollars so a couple of more people who died suddenly much in the same way that uh, Herr Algernon or Herr, Herr Algernon and uh, Olaf Palma died uh, mysteriously and swiftly uh, when they got involved in this apparently worldwide arms scam uh, covering billions of dollars and obviously being uh, a pivotal element in a lot of people's covert political uh, uh, plans. Now, one of the things that's interesting to think about is the fact that uh, up until fairly recently, the U.S. ambassador to Austria was none other than Helena von Damm, who, according to an article in the San Jose Metro, was affiliated with some of Albert Hakim's overseas subsidiaries. We know she was also affiliated with the Reagan administration and with Otto von Bolschwing and with TCI. It's interesting to speculate about the possibility of a von Damm connection to these Austrian arms that went to Iran. Uh, one wonders also whether perhaps the Merrick's connection obtains here or some others. Food for thought, grounds for further research, but we do know that it appears that uh, testifying about that particular Austrian arms case is just as unhealthy as it appears to have been to testify about any of the other aspects of Iran, Contragate, be they in the United States, Italy, or Sweden. Apparently, people have been dropping dead in France, too, possibly in connection with this case. Research credit for the following article also goes to May Brussel. May found this in the D.C. Times from December 19th of 1986. It's by John, the Washington Times, I should say. It's by John, I believe it's McCann, but it's covered over here. John McCann or John McCain of the Washington Times. It's headlines, Slain Frenchman Met Reagan in 84. A French businessman Paris authorities believe may have been assassinated because of his White House connections met with President Reagan in the White House cabinet room in 1984. Glenn Suham, who was shot dead by two gunmen in Paris last September, met with Mr. Reagan at the White House as a part of a group on its, as a part of a group on its return from Grenada. The 1984 trip was the first of two Mr. Suham made to Grenada, apparently in support of Mr. Reagan's policy toward the island nation. A source told the Washington Times yesterday that the second trip in 1986 may have been arranged by Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, the former National Security Council staff member who was fired after it was learned that he had engaged in a scheme to divert funds from secret Iranian arms sales to the Nicaraguan resistance. The White House denies that Mr. Suham had any connection to the, to the NSC, but the international businessman told friends and associates beginning last year that he was doing mysterious work, unquote, for a certain lieutenant colonel, unquote, on the NSC. He said he had been asked to help the White House mainly because of his personal contacts around the world. Skipping down, in another development, the White House confirmed a report in this newspaper yesterday that Mr. Costine and another aide to Mr. Reagan were questioned recently in Paris by French authorities investigating Mr. Suham's death. Costina Reagan aide here, obviously. The Associated Press reported yesterday that White House spokesman Albert R. Brashear originally had dismissed the Washington Times report as a strange story, unquote. Several hours later, however, Mr. Brashear said he had been wrong and that Mr. Costine of the NSC and Frederick Ryan, Mr. Reagan's appointment secretary, were questioned in their Paris hotel room by French authorities and skipping down still further. The White House also has confirmed that at the very instant Mr. Suham was gunned down in front of his posh Paris flat on September 24th, his 58-year-old father, Gerard Suham, was meeting at the White House with administration officials. Mr. Costine was one of those Mr. Suham met with that day. But the NSC employee called the timing of Mr. Suham's visit and the death of his son totally coincidental. Well, that may be the case. However, as we've seen, anyone who in any way uh, attempted to interrupt this arms flow uh, appears to have been deep-sixed. Many of the people who helped with that arms flow uh, disappeared from the scene when it became public. Uh, obviously, as long as the arms are going to the Iran-Iraq war, that war keeps going. The proceeds then go to fund the Contras and keep that war going. So the people who would attempted to interfere with that arms traffic appear to have enjoyed remarkably poor health very soon after attempting that. Also, as we're going to see and have seen, many of the people who helped that arms trade when it became public enjoyed the same serious downturn in their health. Now, with regard to Mr. Suham and the Paris connection, the following article may very well shed some relevant light. Before we jump into the following, I just was going to ask you again. Now, what there was a story, I've just gone suddenly blank on this. There was a story we covered about Alexandre de Marange mm -hmm. and uh, some comments that he made, the, the former French intelligence chief, about what he had helped Ronald Reagan to conceptualize. And that was... He uh, felt that he had helped Reagan to conceptualize the... 
uh, need for strategically controlling or for geographically controlling the strategic materials all around the world. He also felt that he had convinced Ronald Reagan that uh, the future of confrontation with you know, the international communist menace, quote-unquote, lay with stimulating guerrilla wars in uh, socialist or communist-held nations, whereas in the 50s and 60s, guerrilla wars had been waged by socialist or communist movements against more conservative regimes. He felt that the current trend was... Uh, uh, but basically establishing so-called low-intensity warfare against uh, prevailing socialist or communist regimes. And obviously that sort of low-intensity warfare is what we're seeing with the Contras. Uh, de Marange, the former head of the SDECE, a Knight of Malta, incidentally, and uh, someone who claims to have had a lot to do with formulating Reagan's foreign policy. That's right, and of course uh, uh, battling to maintain some kind of grip of, on uh, world uh, strategic uh, resources is also what uh, supposedly uh, informs the Reagan administration's stance in the Middle East. And I was wondering if perhaps uh, Glenn Suom and uh, Mr. De Marange were uh, acquaintances of some sort. Something to check into. on the part of U.S. officials toward knowledgeable informants who raise concerns about Contra activities. Had he lived, Spadafora could well have testified about cocaine smuggling in other Contra camps and raised new questions about how seriously the DEA's information was being taken in Washington. So yet perhaps another casualty in the ongoing uh, uh, hit parade which appears to have uh, centered around the Iran-Contra scandal. Indeed, and uh, with that we are going to again take a break and give you a chance to do the same and those of you taping at home a chance to turn your tape recorders off I suppose and conserve some tape and uh, we will be back to talk about more of the depressing same <laughs> in just a few minutes when Dave Emery and myself Nip Tuck return with more of Radio Free America we're talking about tonight is we're talking about bodies and break-ins dead guys and illegal incursions or however you want to phrase it and that is indeed uh, this is not only is it part five of six of the iran contra hearings but this is part one of two of the cover-up of the iran contra scandal so uh, tonight's part of the cover-up are the dead people who will not testify and the break-ins that we'll get to a little later in the broadcast that will prevent people from having the information necessary to uh, get at the truth and uh, the truth has proved to be very difficult to get at in this case as uh, an article that we just finished reading was entitled, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Now, we're going to begin looking at a number of people who dropped dead during the course of the Iran-Contra investigation, which link a number of European connections to the investigation. We're going to begin by taking a look at a fellow who worked with Oliver North on the Achille Loro hijacking. Now, this is significant for our purposes because one of the... Now, another Latin American official whose death raises questions as to whether he also was killed to keep the Contra supply effort quiet, was a fellow named Dr. Hugh, Hugo Spadafora, S-P-A-D-A-F-O-R-A. -A and uh, about Dr. Hugo Spadafora, Millman writes as follows in that same article. Uh, by the way, this section is subheaded, Drugs, Costa Rica, and the Contras. At almost the same time that Zuniga disappeared, the body of another key player in the Contra war was found stuffed in a U.S. mailbag in Costa Rica, just over the border from Panama. The head had been removed and the torso was covered with bruises. A preliminary autopsy revealed that the victim had been alive when he had been alive when he was decapitated. On the skin was carved the legend F8, a cryptic message Costa Rican officials believed linked the murder to the Panamanian, Panamanian military. The dead man was a Panamanian, Dr. Hugo Spadafora. Spadafora was a romantic figure of some renown in Latin America, the latest in a long line of bourgeois codillos, men of revolutionary action, whose legacy stretches from Simon Bolivar to Fidel Castro and Eden Pastora. Spadafora, like Che Guevara, was trained as a medical doctor and had even served briefly as the country's vice minister of health. Like Che, the Panamanian was attracted to revolutions at home and abroad, volunteering to fight with the Marxist rebels in Guinea-Bissau in the mid-1960s, then with Pastora against Somoza in 1979. In 1982, he joined Pastora's Contra forces, staying with them until 1984 when he broke off to form his own Democratic Contra army based in Costa Rica. Key elements in the Iran Contra supply effort, of the Contra supply effort, was a Syrian-born terrorist armor, armorer, a supplier of arms to terrorists called Manzer el Kassar. He was a fellow who was described as being close to not only Abu Abbas but Abu Nidal and close to uh, thereby by being close to Abu Abbas, the fellow who 
uh, masterminded the Achille Loro hijacking. That particular hijacking, as well p quite possibly as Manzer el Kassar himself, appears to have had a number of connections with uh, residual Nazi elements both inside our own intelligence system and street-level neo-Nazis in Europe. We talked about that at considerable length in, in Radio Free America 32. We're not going to go into it now. But suffice it to say that uh, someone who worked with Oliver North on uh, the Achille Loro hijacking and apparently must have been involved in the entire Iranian arms situation himself was a fellow named Arthur Moreau. We're going to read you about Arthur Moreau now, then we're going to tell you what happened to him. All right, the first article of this part of the broadcast is from the New York Times for Saturday, January 3rd of 1987. The headline, North's Record, A Wide Role in a Host of Sensitive Projects. The article is written by Keith Schneider as a, as a special to the New York Times. It's Dateline, Washington. Rarely has one man's silence stirred such curiosity or held such consequence of that as that of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver L. North. Since he was dismissed from the National Security Council staff by President Reagan on November 25th for his purported role in diverting profits from the Iranian arms sales to Nicaraguan rebels, Colonel North has said virtually nothing about his role in the affair. In recent weeks, however, through interviews with more than 40 current and former top-ranking officials in the White House, the State Department, and the Pentagon, a clearer picture of Colonel North's five-year career on the staff of the National Security Council has emerged. Skipping along in the article itself to another page. Probably the most important step in Colonel North's career on the National S Security Council staff, according to former staff members, occurred in the spring of 1983 when he was appointed to a secret Central America policy group that met regularly at the State Department. The group called the Restricted Interagency Group was formed in 1981 by Thomas O. Enders, then Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. Along with Mr. Enders, the group's members included Dwayne Claridge, a Central Intelligence Agency official and expert on covert operations, Vice Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, Jr., and Moreau's last name is spelled M-O-R-E-A-U, a representative from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Nestor Sanchez, a representative from the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Skipping down, just, oh, well, let me just recap that real quickly. The restricted interagency group that was founded uh, by Thomas O. Enders included not only North, but Dwayne Claridge, somebody we've talked about in the past, Vice Admiral Arthur S. Moreau, and Nestor Sanchez. Skipping down in the article. By late 1985, it would have been second nature for Mr. McFarland to seek Colonel North's assistance. In mid-June that year, Colonel North had been dispatched to the Middle East by Mr. McFarland, of course, as National Security uh, Council, uh, National Security Advisor. Given Spadafora's quite public opposition to Panamanian leader General Manuel Antonio Noriega, there seems little doubt that his, mur that his murder was ordered or at least welcomed in Panama. But the real reason for the killing may rest with Spadafora's knowledge of widespread drugs for arms trafficking within the Contra movement in Costa Rica. The earliest indications of a Contra drug operation in Costa Rica emerged in the summer of 1985 when an unnamed top drug enforcement administration official from the U.S. Embassy in San Jose told the English language daily Tico Times that Contras were now part of the drugs for arms trade that was becoming increasingly common throughout Latin America. Spadafora believed that his political enemy, Panama's General Noriega was involved in the Contra drug trade. A later Associated Press story by reporters Brian Barger and Robert Perry mentioned a U.S. intelligence study that linked the forces of Aden Pastora, a Spadafora ally turned rival to drug trafficking, alleging that some 250,000 in drug crop profits had been used to buy ammunition and a new helicopter. During the week before his abduction, Spadafora visited the U.S. Embassy in San Jose, where, according to the local daily La Nación, he met three times with the United States' top drug investigator in Costa Rica, DEA Special Agent Robert Nieves, or Nieves, N-I-E-V-E-S. Nieves later dismissed their conversations as nothing important, unquote, but sources familiar with the pair's conversations say Spadafora linked a noted Contra drug smuggler from Costa Rica and said the smuggler had fled to Panama and was being protected by General Noriega's army. The cavalier attitude with which, with which Spadafora's claims were apparently met fits a disturbing pattern of seeming indifference